Well, good morning, church, and hope you are enjoying your time of worship and prayer together this morning with one another. Um, thanks for taking the time to uh, be involved in these home meetings, and uh, you know it, it is a real blessing that uh, to the body of Christ in general, I believe that you guys are doing this where you are because it really opens up avenues for bringing. Uh, people to home meetings and exposing people to the gospel, um, and uh, that's that's really vital in this day and age because I think in many cases the church itself, um, you know, the structure in the four walls and all that kind of thing doesn't doesn't adequately meet the needs uh, that everybody has, and so uh, you know the the home environment is a real blessing to. Uh, to people because it allows people to uh, come along in a in a very friendly environment and just experience the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, we want to have a look uh, again this morning in Judges, and we'll start in Judges chapter one. But just a reminder: last week we uh, started looking at a series on Judges, and this is not going to be you know the world's most in-depth series, but there's a lot for us to learn from it. And we started reading from uh, Joshua 23 and 4, uh, where Joshua brings the uh, the leaders of Israel together and he speaks to them about maintaining their separation from the nations around them and, and maintaining a, um, uh, a close walk with God in conjunction or in obedience to his commands to them and to the law of God. And Israel failed miser fails miserably in this. Uh, and that's why I've titled, entitled the series a Israel, a Failing Nation, uh, with the subtitle, The Sad Record of Judges, which is really a record of the uh, Shakespearean statement um, unto thine own self be true, which was also adopted by Satanism, essentially. And it is a, it is a very uh, satanic idea, unto thine own self be true, be true to yourself. And it's, it's not wrong if we have a sense of right and wrong. Um, but it is wrong if we're going to use ourselves as the arbiter. Of right and wrong and that's really important and so when we uh, looked at Joshua last week and his close, closing message to the children of, children of Israel we saw that um, uh, Joshua had declared that they would take the land and they live in victory and they would be an example to the nations surrounding them of the goodness of Jehovah if if they would honor the Lord um, and his law that that he gave to them, and so uh, that's that's where we were at last week. So why don't we um, why don't we just open in a word of prayer right now and just ask the Lord to bless the um, uh, the remainder of this message. Now, Father, we thank you this morning and we praise you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness toward us, and we thank you for the records of books such as judges, which do not hide the failings of man. Your people, uh, the nation of Israel, were chosen by you to reflect your goodness to the world around. But you established a covenant with them that declared that if they obeyed you, they would be that example, and if they disobeyed you, that you would punish them in front of the nations. And we thank you, Lord, that you have not hidden your interaction with man and that it has not been glossed over. So we praise you for this. We ask you, Lord, help us to learn deeply uh, so that we may walk with you closely and honour you with our lives. Amen. All right. So uh, Joshua said that they could take the land, they could live in victory, and they would be a, an example of the blessing of God to the surrounding nations. They would be an example to the surrounding nations of the blessing of God upon themselves through their obedience and 
and if they would honour the Lord in, in their worship and in their praise and if they would remain a sanctified people. But they failed to take the land, they failed to consider the law, they failed to honour God, they failed to worship him uh, correctly, they failed to be sanctified and set apart from the surrounding nations, they compromised in all kinds of evil. And this is part of the theme of the book of Judges and it becomes a very important theme because God may promise things to us but many times those promises are dependent on um, the behavior of the believer. Now the New Testament is markedly different. Salvation is not dependent upon our works. Um, salvation is a gift of God granted to the person who places faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith that is accompanied by repentance. It's not just a, um, it's it's not just a, um, a, a vacuum. You know, we're not talking about just faith in anything. It is faith that is accompanied by repentance, faith in Yeshua the Messiah. And so, uh, the key theme of uh, judges is this theme that people did what was right in their own eyes and that is shown to us in uh, Judges 17.6 and I've got it in the New King James here um, and uh, in the text which says in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes and the ESV uh, says exactly the same thing. It's important that God would include this in the scriptural record because it's a vindication of him it is a backing up of exactly what he said that he would do um, it's a vindication of what God allows the people to do and what God um, brings back to them in return because he promised if you do this then you will receive these blessings. However, if you disobey, then you will receive this punishment. And so rather than follow the Lord, his word, the clear guidance of the direction of the voice of God, they followed their own hearts, right? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It literally means everyone was a law to himself. Sorry, just move this chair. So this, this is a very important record for us because they were being true to themselves. Be true to yourself, baby girl. So Judges gets its name from these regional leaders and we, we see them appear in uh, uh, chapter 2. We see that God brings the Judges into play there. Um, uh, the Lord raises up judges, verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Now, we'll, we'll come to that a little bit more in a moment. It gets its name, though, from these judges. And they, they weren't really um, judges in the sense of, um, you know, a courtroom kind of judge. They were more of a, a, a regional um, political and military leader, uh, uh, like a like a, a tribal chieftain, and the book of Judges begins with this uh, record of Joshua's death in Judges one, uh, verse one through to seven. Let's read there. Now, after the death of Joshua. It came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Now, this is the right response, that they seek God. Who will be first? Who, who, who among us should go up first and go against the Canaanites? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me. To my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. Now, um, and Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they killed ten thousand men at Bezek, and they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled 
And they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. So he's, he's left with that on each hand and he doesn't have the big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done. So God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem and there he died. Now, this starts off in the right direction. They, they began by inquiring of the Lord. And this is often the case even in Christianity today. You know, the, there's a, um, a move of God and, the, and people are touched. And, and so, you know, as a result of that, some dramatic things happen and people are getting saved and a church is established. And, um, but people are praying and seeking God. Those ravens are noisy. They're, they're praying and seeking God, and God is giving them direction. He's, he's uh, sharing to them. He's, he's prompting them and stirring them about directions to take. And this is how Israel begins. They begin by inquiring of the Lord, who is going to go first against the Canaanites? And they had a victory. But they had a victory because they inquired of God and they obeyed the direction of God. Send um, um, Judah, right? And this that's the tribe of Judah. He's not talking about a person called Judah. It's the tribe of Judah. And Judah asked Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, to help as well. So, And they had a victory. But Judges is a record of Israel's total failure. This small victory at the beginning is is really there as a prologue to say, look at how they began. They began by inquiring of God. And, and that, is, that is it, right? And it seems that many Christians have a view of the nation of Israel as a people deserving sainthood, that, that the nation of Israel is this righteous nation. But this is far from the truth, and it was far from the truth then. Um, Israel has been uh, the record of a nation of sinful people. And they came under the harsh judgment of God. And the book of Judges really records these people God raised up to deliver them. However, the nation of Israel continued in sin after sin after sin after sin. And one reason that God allowed harsh judgment to come upon Israel was because they were given divine revelation. They were given knowledge. They were given the law of God. They were given a mode of worship. They were given an understanding of the identity of, of um, Yahweh. Um, they were uh, delivered from oppression in Israel. They were taken through the wilderness by the hand of God. And there they also received judgment and blessing. Judgment as they disobeyed. Blessing as they repented. Um, they were the recipients of divine intervention and, and divine mercy. And out of all of this, instead of honouring God, they consistently failed. And so within a very short period of time, so we start off with this record, but when we skip down to verse 27, we get a record of uh, Israel's fa failure. Verse 27, however, Manasseh, did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute but did not completely drive them out, or they, they put them under forced labour. Uh, uh, under a taxation system. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Ge Giza, so the Canaanites dwelt in Giza among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute or put under forced labour. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or Aleb, uh, Aksib, Halbar, Afik, Rehob. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. 
nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Aneth. Uh, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Aneth were put under tribute to them, forced labor and taxation. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley, and the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres, in Ijalon, and Shalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute, under this taxation again. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. So immediately, um, Judges becomes a record of failure. And that they did not drive out these inhabitants, but instead used them for labor. Now, this really struck me with a question of were the Israelites then sitting back and enjoying the the spoils of war by um, enslaving these nations so they literally sat back and uh, sipped peach tea on their porches uh, while they watched the inhabitants um, work the land and bring in the produce. That's the way it kind of reads to me, is that uh, if we drive them out, we'll have to do the work. Why don't we instead make a little arrangement, we'll allow them to live here, but look, let's treat them like the Egyptians treated us. Let's do that. We learned a lot under the Egyptians. So as Israel increasingly failed or refused to drive out the inhabitants, they committed acts of slavery. Now, slavery is, is not always. Um, in, the, in the scripture, slavery wasn't just a straightforward um, uh, mechanism that is shown to us via you know, the means of Hollywood. Um, there were all different forms of slavery. But this was the very thing that they were subjected to and groaned under the subjection of for 400 years in Egypt. So the Lord visits and explains why this um, uh, why he was going to um, not bless them. And that's in Judges 2, 1-5. to Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed. Notice that. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, you shall tear down their altars. It seems to me that as they left these people in the land, they were making covenants with them. They were saying, look, we won't drive you out. Keep your homes, stay here. Um, and it seems to me that they did not tear down the altars. But you have not obeyed my voice, the Lord declares. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted their voices and wept. Then they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. This is the religious mentality. Things go bad, and we instantly, uh, oh Lord, Lord, please. 
bochim. Uh, the word means weepers, and it could be understood as the place of the weepers. Then they called the name of that place bochim. Uh, they called it the place of the weepers, or the place of weepers. Now, there's a clarification here um, about the angel of the Lord. I believe this is a, a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus. And it's because the angel of the Lord says, I led you from Egypt. I sw swore to give you this land. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now, um, I don't believe this is God speaking through an angel. I believe this is the Lord speaking. And he is um, so distressed and angry with them that he appears to them. And he says, I made this covenant and you were not to make any covenants with the inhabitants. You were to break down their altars. So the point being that that when the Lord moves through a people, there is to be a sanctification of those people whereby they move away from the sinful behavior and they don't embrace paganism. And if you remember um, a decade or so ago, um, and it's continuing uh, to this very time in in places like that, that Bethel and the International House of Prayer and stuff like that, that there is a, a lot of Old Testament-like practices being performed. You know, there's um, uh, candles and incense burning and prayer altars uh, with incense burning there and uh, writing prayers on pieces of paper and burning them in this... Uh, brazen laver, um, all these kinds of things that go on. And so God speaks to the children of Israel and he says, I don't want you to be involved in any of these pagan things. You're to break down their altars. And he says to them, but you have not obeyed. Uh, and so now these very people that you refuse to drive out, so now I've kept them there and these people are going to be a problem to you. And their gods will be a snare to you. It's interesting, interesting passage. These people are going to become a problem to you. I'm, I'm keeping them there now. You won't be able to drive them out. And they, uh, their gods are going to be a snare to you. Um, so as I said, I believe the angel of the Lord is an appearance of Yeshua or Jesus. And so he speaks in the first person with them about the covenant that he made with them and about their obedience, and that their gods will be a snare to you. Um, so when the Israelites did not show obedience, remember they've been given this amazing revelation, and it's a growing revelation of God. It's been growing um, since they left Egypt all the time. God has been revealing more about, of himself and re revealing more of his plan for them, and um, when they didn't show obedience in this situation, did not remove the nations, did not break down the altars, but instead they um, looked at these people and said, you know what, we could, we could enslave these people. Um, we can sit back and be fat and rich. Uh, let's just enjoy the, the spoils of war. Why not make these people part of the spoils of war? Let's do that. Well, this led to them embracing um, and, and tolerating paganism. We, we're not going to remove you. We won't, we won't break down your altars. Uh, you can use them. And not only did they tolerate, but they began embracing and practicing these uh, false pagan worship practices. They began intermarrying among the people, and this led to all kinds of evil practices as we'll see as we go through so now at this point judges kind of reverses the timeline a little bit and we get judges 2 6 to 10 uh, now and when joshua had dismissed all the people so it kind of flips back to the end of the book of joshua um, the children of israel went each to his own inheritance to possess a land so this is this is how things worked um, when joshua had dismissed them uh, they went out and they were supposed to uh, possess the, the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. 
who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him with the border of his inheritance, uh, within the border of his inheritance in Timnath Herez, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all the generation that had gathered to their when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Okay. Let's just read verse ten again. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. This is not a statement, an ignorant statement. Um, this statement is about the deliberation of the hearts of the Israelite people, that they were a people who uh, were not surrendered to the Lord. That's why they did not know him. This is not that they could not have known him. Uh, Judges 2, 11 to 15, Then the children of Israel did evil, in the sight of the Lord. So verse 10 says, after Joshua and the and these fathers of Israel, this generation had passed on, this next generation that arose did not know God. And they they weren't remembering. It's not that they had no record. They were not remembering the mighty works that God had done for them in delivering Israel. Verse 11, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. I believe it's pronounced. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. You know, the, the, the thing is that God is simply keeping his promise here. He said, this is what will happen. And he was keeping their prom his promise to them. And this is where the judges enter the scene. So Judges 2, 16 to 23. And in a moment, we'll close off. And I'll leave you with this today to discuss. Um, judges 2, 16 to 23. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges. But they played the harlot with, their, with other gods and bowed down to them. This is how God repeatedly um, describes unfaithfulness among, uh, those, uh, among the people of faith. When we're unfaithful to uh, God and, and get involved in idolatry, he calls it harlotry. So um, it is a form of prostitution. They prostituted themselves to other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly away they turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the lord they did not do so okay they did not obey the commandments of the lord and when the lord raised up judges for them the lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge for the lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them as per the promise of god and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So this is not repentance. This is, oh God, help me, I've been caught in this sinful behavior. Okay. Um, Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. This is why God left these nations there and did not allow the children of Israel to push them out. God left the nations in the land Israel was supposed to conquer and he left them there for reasons. And the reason was a twofold reasons. If they disobeyed, God would use those nations to punish Israel. However, 
There was another way more wonderful reason, that if Israel actually obeyed, then Israel would be a testimony to these other nations of the covenant that God had with Israel, and this would provoke those nations to jealousy about the God Yahweh. And so God used these nations uh, that they were supposed to conquer to punish them in their sin and their idolatry because he couldn't use Israel as a testimony of God's greatness because of their unfaithfulness. Um, so what an amazing passage for us. Judges 2.17, yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. As the children of God, and you and I are not the children of God by birth. Um, in fact, Israelites are not the children of God by birth. God has a purpose for the nation of Israel, but Israelites must come to faith. And I, I would urge you to study that out because someone born an Israelite does not automatically go to heaven. Someone born in your family does not automatically go to heaven. Um, now, as believers, you and I are one generation away from failing in sin. So, you know, there's a saying, God has no grandchildren. And this is an important understanding, and it's not a New Testament understanding. This comes immediately from the Old Testament. It's demonstrated to us by passages like Judges, um, as the Joshua and the elders of the nation were, were uh, died and were buried. Uh, there arose another generation that did not know God. Um, you know, your children are not born believers. You can practice inter infant baptism. It does nothing to save that child's soul. You can proclaim it if you want. You can say we're members of this or that church. It does not do a thing. You can call your family a Christian family, but unless someone in your family has repented, then they are not part of that Christian family. They're part of that family, that human family. Each one of us must come to repentance and faith. And Ezekiel 18 is a powerful record of this in closing, verses 25 to 32, because no one is born into the kingdom of God. Each of us must Demonstrate our faith by repentance, placing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, faith and repentance <clears throat> are said like they're two separate things. What must I do? Repent and place faith in Jesus. They're one thing. They are the two sides of one coin. The one coin is salvation, the gift of God. Repentance and faith are a unit. In fact, I like to describe it as a repentant faith. Ezekiel 18.25 says, Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and yours which is not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgression which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair, O house of Israel. Is it not my way, my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. This is the justice of God, that God judges each of us according to our ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Now, uh, verse 32 
for I have no pleasure in the, in the death of the one who dies, um, is often used just in that manner. But in the context of the passage, the passage is um, a person lives a righteous life and lives. A person turns from God, lives a sinful life and dies. God takes no pleasure in that death. All right? Um, therefore, turn and live. So the context of it is, is a passage that is about repentance. Repent from sin and turn and walk with God. Okay, so look, we'll, we'll leave it there. What a, um, we're still really in the introductory stages, but uh, understand this. God is just. He provides the judges because of the groaning of the people. They were groaning because of their own sin, and even with the judges, they, they continue being sinfully disobedient. So um, yeah, we'll leave it there, and God bless you today. Enjoy your fellowship together, and I, I do hope that this passage stirs some great conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it with that. God bless you.